Good morning all, this is Nathan. Maybe it's not morning with you, but uh, there we go. All right, well, we're in uh, book four, of, volume four of um, A Word in Season, short messages, two to three minutes. And let's see how many chapters we can get in about half an hour or so. So let's, let's begin. 29. 29. Mountain Bottom Life One of the great moments in the Gospels occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration. Ay, 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 ay. On the Mount of... One of the great moments in the Gospels occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration. In the presence of Peter, James and John, our Lord was transfigured, so that even his raiment became shining. Mark 9, 1-5 Furthermore, Moses and Elijah appeared to talk with Jesus as the great representatives of the law and the prophets. They came to be with the great... They came to be with the greatest prophet and lawgiver. All right. The reaction of Peter was a natural one. He wanted to build some kind of memorial or monument to the event and to stay there. To remain with our mountaintop experiences, with the high points of our life, is a temptation for all of us. To get on with the normal business is unpleasant for many. I've encountered young couples whose basic problem has been the failure to realise that marriage cannot be one long honeymoon. It's the daily work of life together. All had a similar problem with the church in Thessalonica. The members, all new converts, wanted to go from conversion to the rapture with no work in between. All ordered them to, quote, study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 In other words, the main concern of the Christian is the responsibility of faithfulness in everyday living, duties and problems. Those who want excitement in their marriage, their church life or their daily living are saying that they do not want responsibility nor do they want maturity. Paul, speaking against the hunger for continual, quote, higher experiences, end quote, said, quote, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things, end quote. Now, Paul said, I meet life responsibilities as a mature man in Christ with faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 to 13. This is God's requirement for all of us. Just as the valleys of California are more productive than our mountaintops, so too are the daily duties of the Christian walk more productive than the mountaintop experiences. Okay, I'm really pleased with the waveform. Um, I'm working on a few things for my voiceover sensei. You know who you are, Dean. That's all I'm going to say for the meantime. I don't want to give away his secret location. All right, on to um, 30. Sin, 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 sin. 30. Sin. Hang on a second. We're not recording. Now I know why. It's not rooting correctly. Analog 2, that almost cost me a lot of money, that mistake. 30. Sin. The Bible defines sin thus, quote, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. End quote. 1 John 3 4. Our Lord makes clear that the source of sin is the heart of man. Matthew 5. Look at that beautiful waveform. Oh my goodness, that's gorgeous. <laughs> Matthew fifteen nineteen. This is a very important fact and very necessary for us to understand. All too many people reduce sin to an act, for example, one of murder, adultery, 
theft, false witness, or covetousness. Clearly, all these things are examples of sinful acts, but sin is much more than an act. It is first and foremost a condition in the heart and mind of man. Many people are quote-unquote good because they are afraid of trouble with the law, their wife or husband or their community. Their hearts are all the same, given over to the root of all sin, lawlessness in relationship to God as their Lord and lawgiver. Sin, moreover, is a religious act because it is revolt against God and his law and it is a religious faith that the tempter is right and that every man has the right to be his own God, knowing or deciding what is good and evil for himself. Genesis 3, 5 The sinner is thus religiously against God and Christ. His faith is in something or someone other than the Lord. Essentially, it is faith in himself. For the ungodly, sin, therefore, is life. They hold that a person is not really living unless he is a party to sin, that is, to the sex revolution, the drug culture, or whatever else his sin may be. Such opinions show the religious nature of sin. But the Christian life is in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. This means that knowledge, holiness, righteousness and dominion are not only the aspects of God's image in us, but also life for us. For us, then, sin is not life but death, and righteousness is our way of life. If we find sin attractive, it is because we do not find Christ to be attractive to us. It means that an alien faith governs our hearts and dominates our thinking. To believe in Christ means to enjoy not sin but righteousness. That was an awesome chapter. Oh God, mm. and our heart. How y'all doing? How's everything with the self? Look at that waveform, so clean. Oh, that's beautiful. Thirty-one, daydreams. There is neither dreaming nor daydreaming in heaven, but only in hell. To dream or to daydream is to imagine what might be or what might have been, and the redeemed of the Lord live in an eternal day which surpasses all imagination. On the other hand, our Lord gives us an insight into the mind of a certain rich man in hell. This fool imagined that if one from the dead were to visit his five brothers, they would repent and avoid hell. But the word of Abraham to the rich man was, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The, what the Lord? Oh, Dad, the scripture. Quote, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. End quote. Luke 16, 31. As our Lord did. This rich man was in effect dreaming that he too would have repented if a man from the dead had witnessed to him. It is, however, the essence of the fool and the sinner to prefer dreams and illusions to reality. In their mind's eye, they can always do everything. Years ago, I remember someone saying enviously of another man's success, I could have done that. To which someone answered, not with originality, but with truth, Yes, but you didn't. Those who live in terms of their daydreams soon despise reality and its opportunities. Possibilities lie not in the dream world, but in reality, in the world around us. The daydreaming of the sinner is about sin, Genesis 6, 5. It is, therefore, only evil continually. The Bible, indeed our Lord himself, forbids us to spend our time imagining what evils lie ahead, Quote, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew 6.34 We're required to trust and obey the Lord always, to do our duty, and to leave the future then in His hands. Our thinking about what might be or what might have been is needless and also wrong. It's our obedience to the Lord that best reckons with tomorrow's problems. 
Oh, I'm so pleased with that waveform. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's a wonderful. Ah, that's just wonderful, huh? Analog 2, you know what you do. Look it. 32. Roots and Fruits. It's been said of one of the most famous architects of this century, quote, He was a great architect, but his roofs usually leaked, end quote. Such a statement is nonsense. If an art architect... Artichoke? <laughs> if it's an artichoke, it's a vegetable. Hello, Pato. Hello, Pato. Got lost there. If an architect's roof leak, roof's leak, if an arch... That's... It's a twist, Danga. If an architect's roof leaks, he's a very bad architect. But some people would insist otherwise, which is like saying that a man who beats, betrays and finally murders his wife was a very loving husband. However, many claim that someone is great or a holy man despite the obvious evidences otherwise. One famous pastor adored by his huge congregation and radio audiences is a terror to his office staff and associates because of his abusive and paranoid ways and has a continuous turnover of help. Many still excuse him and explain away his manifestly unchristian conduct as a product of quote-unquote stress. Our Lord allows no such excuses. Quote, By their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7.20 Thorn bushes don't produce grip. Kalaflo. Thorn bushes do not produce grapes, nor thistles figs, and neither do fruit trees bear poison berries. Look to their fruits, our Lord demands. To make excuses for people and to attribute their bad manners, immoral dealings and profane conduct to stress is to say that we are better judges of men than is Jesus Christ himself. To say so is to sin. Who suffers most from such dishonesty? A mother told me that her son was really a very good boy and, quote, at heart, end quote, a Christian. She did not change her son thereby, and it soon cost her $3,450 she could not afford to bail him out of his troubles. She paid a high price for her denial of the truth, and will soon pay more. When we go against God's word, we do not change that word, but we pay a price for denying it. God's word is truth, and every departure from truth exacts its price. If a man's roof leak, he is a bad architect. If a pastor's conduct is leak, if a pastor's conduct is bad, it's because he is also. If a son is a wastrel and a profligate, it's because he is an evil son. Saying otherwise will not change reality and not all our soft or kindly words can regenerate ungodly men. Only the Lord can do that. For that, we need to be in prayer always, and at the same time to pray for faith to believe in his word and to apply it. Hey, my friend, Lazician, ain't very good. I sound like a leprechaun all the time. Uh. All right. Well, where are we? Okay, great. Oh, no, you don't. Okay, so analog. Mistake that almost cost me $200. Pound dollars. 33. Losers. A loser is a man who sees life as hopeless, who insists that the deck is stacked, the dice loaded, and man doesn't have a chance. A loser is an unbeliever. He believes that everything works together for evil because his because life is supposed to be good luck. Woof ho. I make burp in mouth. No good. Oh, 
because life is supposedly meaningless and the world totally irrational. Therefore, get what you can while you can, is his idea. As man, uh, as men abandon... As men abandon God, they pick up the faith and philosophy of a loser. They may be rich or poor, but all men with such a faith are losers. God decrees their future. In Obadiah's words, ghost... Quost. Quost. I like the quost. I the quost. In Obadiah's words, quote, As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Obadiah 15. Maybe that sounds like a question to un-Irish people. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Obadiah 15. Men reap what they sow. Galatians 6 7. And the losers are busy sowing future disasters. Now, if you're outside of Christ, you're a loser. You have ruled out the triune God and, in effect, declared that the universe is a mindless, senseless accident, so that truth and righteousness are not basic to it. It is then you against the universe, all men and death. And you are the sure loser, even apart from God's judgment. Those who live in Christ have a faith for victory. Quote, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 This means simply that God's holy purpose governs all events, including the fact of sin, to make it add up finally for good. Instead of being losers, we are inescapable winners. Ours is a faith for victory. Thus, if you are Christ's, stop talking about defeat. There is a world to be conquered, and we are the people called to do it. We are not big love fo fo fo. We do not bring a percentage or a numerically ranked nation of love to each other. What? What is that? What? What do you mean? Let's uh, try this, shall we? Before we record it. We do not bring a percentage or a numerically ranked nation ration of love to each of each task or person. Hmm. This is an unusual statement. That's unusual. We do not bring a percentage or a numerically ranked ration of love to each task. I don't understand. We don't bring a percentage or a numerically ranked ration of love to each task or person, but God's appointed way. John tells us that we love our brethren in Christ because we love the Lord. And if we hate the brethren, it's because we hate the Lord and love darkness. 1 John 2, 9-11 To love God with all our being means to love the brethren, our wife, husband, children and others as God requires us to love them. When all our being is given to the love of God, this means also that all our being is also given to loving what God has appointed us to love. Love is not a quantity, it is a quality and a way of life. Quote, God is love, end quote, and we love one another because God first of all loved us in Christ and because we are his new creation, we manifest his love and grace to one another. 1 John 4, 7-19 To be alive in Christ means to manifest in every relationship the grace and love of God in Christ. It's not very ideal, but it's okay. Alright, analog one, analog two, how'd you do? Very nice. Alright. Thirty four. Science says All my life I've been hearing all kinds of solemn nonsense prefixed by the words science says. 
When I was in the seventh grade, our science teacher read predictions by a number of scientists about the future germ-free world when everyone would be living in glass-enclosed cities and farms. Now we know that most germs are beneficial and that life is impossible without them, but our scientists have not learned humility. I have a book by a prize-winning scientist in which he blames the Puritans for our desire for a germ-free world. The Puritans, of course, had nothing to do with what scientists taught a few years back. Again, in junior and senior high school and at the university, I was faithfully taught that our coal and oil reserves were small and the world would be with a calabado. I was faithfully taught that our coal and oil reserves were small and the world would be without coal and oil in about 25 years. Well, 25 years have come and gone and the estimate of the world's reserves is higher, but we still hear the same talk. In the early and mid-1960s, Ah, I sound like Irish, man. But we still hear the same talk. In the early and mid-1960s, a California scientist made all kinds of frightening predictions about world overpopulation by 1975, and two other men predicted worldwide famine by 1975. But none of them are laughed at today, and they are still being quoted solemnly by the faithful followers of the cult of science. The strong faith in the face of all evidence which most people have in science, is really amazing. When I hear that science says something that... Hmm, hello. <clears throat> when they hear that science says something, they're bad... Hang on a second, got a phone call coming in here. Okie dokie, had to take a phone call there. When they hear that science says something, they abandon all common sense and listen obediently to the current garbage. Many scientists tell us that a healthy scepticism is basic to science. What we too often see is the blindness of faith. On the other hand, these same people listen sleepily if at all, to the proclamations of Scripture. Thus saith the Lord, does not arouse in them the instant attention or curiosity which science says does, because their faith is not in the Lord, but in science, one of the modern Baals. A man listens to what he believes in, and man's thinking is determined by his faith. St. Paul speaks of those who have itching ears to hear lies and false doctrine, and there will always be people to supply itching ears with the nonsense they are drawn to. Problem lies in us. Will we have itching ears or hearing ears? Will we say with the psalmist, I will delight myself in thy statutes, I will not forget thy word, Psalm 119.16, or will we be open to the word of every learned fool who claims to be an authority? Alright. Thirty-five. Speech. Our small oh, salabado. He no record, man. He's no recording. Oh, amen. Thirty-five, Speech Our speech very commonly dates us. For example, I grew up in California on a farm in the kerosene lamp days, and I can spot others. And I can spot others to help us spot the better. And I can spot others who have the same background. It's very easy. If one says, put out the light, they learned to talk when kerosene lamps were still in use. Nowadays, children are told to turn on or flip off the lights. It's even easier to spot people from the south or from Scotland. Their accent is a giveaway. 
But our language tells more about us than where we were born and how we grew up. It manifests our faith and character. It reveals our heart. Proverbs 18.21 declares, quote, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That is, those who love to talk freely must take the consequence thereof. Our words thus are a power and a witness to death or to life, and what they witness to is governed by what we are. Quote, For as he, a man, thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23.7 And so too is his speech. The question then is what our speech reveals about our hearts. Are we governed by life or by death? Do we manifest the life of one redeemed by Christ, or do we reek of death, sourness, stupid self-interest and self-satisfaction whenever we open our mouths? We are a giveaway whenever we speak. Sooner or later people will recognize what's on our hearts. Being guarded in our speech is always important. It's the mark of a fool to speak without thinking and to be too quick to express himself. But being guarded is not enough. The heart is the problem. An unregenerate heart will manifest its flavour of death in speech, even as a person who is a new creation will be unable to conceal, if he chose, the life which governs him. One of the highest words of sp- <laughs> One of the highest words of praise in scripture is spoken with reference to speech of the godly wife whose, quote, price is far above rubies. Hello, bottle. Price is far above rubies, end quote. It said, quote, she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is a law of kindness. Proverbs 31, 26. If others can say that of us, then we are rich indeed, and we need no higher praise, because our words and our life praise us. Need a drink of water. Love in that waveform. Very nice. Thirty-six. Consequences. No, let's record it this time. Yeah, it's gone. Thirty six. Consequences. I'm told by a reliable authority that, on a major urban freeway, the acts of a driver have far reaching effects. Thus, if at a particular spot on a freeway drivers in any lane or all lanes break their car at a particular moment, a long chain reaction sets in. For at least an hour and sometimes as much as two hours, all cars reaching that approximate point during the rush hour will be breaking their cars. A single action sets up a chain of consequences and reactions which lasts long after the braking driver has passed. This kind of chain of consequences is even more true in the world of ideas. Wherever someone throws out an idea which runs counter to God's purposes, a long chain of reactions and consequences follows. Our Lord had this in mind when he declared, quote, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. End quote. Matthew 18.6 We don't live in a world without people. What we are and what we do has an impact on the world around us. We can set up a variety of consequences by our actions. Our unwillingness to make a stand conveys itself to others and we become a millstone of impediment to them. Again, our faults or evil decisions, words and actions carry an impact on our world which adds to the evil we compromise with. On the other hand, To be a man of faith and obedience to the Lord sets up a chain of reactions also, a very healthy one. Give it me. A very healthy one. 
Several years ago, I met a man in my travels who was deeply indebted for his faith in life to a man he had never met. The first man had made an impact on the life of a second man who had influenced a third and so on across the country. But accidentally, they learned of the start of their new life and it made them strongly aware of the chain of consequences in every man's actions. No man can live unto himself. As John Donne years ago, make up the words, it's okay, it's freestyling time. No man can live unto himself. As John Donne long ago observed, no man is an island. Every man is a part of a community life. Every man is a part of a community of life and his thoughts, words and actions have consequences in his life and in the lives of others. Mm-mm. Let's try that ending again. Try not to. And the lives of others. The question is this. Will your consequences bring you a reward or a millstone around your neck? Remember, our Lord says, quote, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew twelve thirty six. Okay, let's maybe try another one. Not sure. Okay, I've got a break there and uh, going to take a cup of tea, have some meat and uh, reconvene back here. Hope to see you for the next part of... A Word in Season, Volume 2. See you later.